All right. I think we can get started. I can. I, I see still people rolling in, but we'll we'll get started. And uh, and by the time we really hit the real topic, I'm sure we get uh, we get everybody in. So so thank you thank you for joining. Uh, welcome to the to the second spring session of uh, of uh, SAS Camp 2024. Uh, so everybody can probably see at least here in Espo, it's it's a great nice weather outside. So I hope you have your 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 favorite cup of mocha and uh, and, and you can uh, lean back, relax, and and listen to listen to uh, to Lars uh, present us today. Uh, my name is Sami Ahunemi. I'm one of the uh, general partners here at Vendip Capital, and and I'm hosting hosting the session today uh, here here with Lars. Uh, we had a great session yesterday on, on the South Camp with with Johannes Morus from Relix. Uh, uh, telling how they were driving and they are driving their hyper growth. Uh, for those that couldn't uh, join yesterday, uh, yesterday's session, the recording link will be available uh, very shortly, as will be the recording of, of today. And today we continue around the same topic as yesterday. So scaling, scaling from very early stage uh, startup to to from from zero to to hero to very high numbers. And and to, to today we have uh, with us here Lars Nordwell, that is one of the most experienced Nordic persons that have operated and scaled companies in Silicon Valley. But before I let uh, let Lars get going, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items here. So, if and when uh, you come up with questions, please post them on the Q and A panel. Uh, we will follow those but then most likely answer the questions at the end of the presentation so we kind of get through the, the great content Lars is, is delivering uh, today. We had some issues yesterday, but uh, but we are confident all of that is fixed and we're actually able to get uh, get uh, get live into the questions uh, after the session. So so very good. Thank you for joining. And, and without, uh, without further ado, Lars, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm sure you do your own introduction uh, to the people. So, so let's kick it off. Thank you for joining. Fabulous. Thank you, Sami. Uh, honored to be on uh, this webinar. Uh, let's try to make it somewhat interactive. Uh, we will leave questions to the end. But if there is anything you would want to bring up throughout the presentation, uh, do not hesitate. Submit a question, and then I'm sure Sami will uh, kindly interrupt me. Uh, Sami and I have uh, worked together throughout, what is it now, uh, 12 years, 13 years. Uh, he was an early investor with Neo4j and uh, was uh, instrumental helping me, helping Emil and other leaders to ramp the company uh, throughout a number of challenging moments. Uh, and then we finally, a uh, year and a half ago, hit 150 million in ARR. So today we're going to talk about how to scale sales to that next level. Um, and uh, here is the agenda. So first of all, we're going to take a step back and discuss what it means to scale sales. I think it's important to, to just address how I define that. Uh, we're going to talk about the leadership and the communication required to move a company fast throughout a number of different phases. Um, but throughout the entire presentation, I will stay more focused on the early stage from zero to 10 million rather than 10 million to 100 million, but, but you will get the complete picture. Uh, we're going to get into the customer strategy. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the most important thing, the sales culture, the sales organization, and the comp plans that's going to drive uh, that scale. Sales territories and pipeline will be part of that. And then uh, getting into sales operations, analytics, and legal. That's a critical component as well uh, as part of this organization. And then finally, tips and tricks and uh, probably about 15 minutes Q&A. So in terms of background, I will let you guys check out my LinkedIn profile, or if we have a follow-up discussion with, with uh, Sami and Vendip Capital and myself, uh, uh, I welcome that very much as well. 
But uh, shortly, uh, I've spent time with four different companies uh, throughout my 30-year uh, career. Most of the time spent with my most recent company, Neo4j, uh, where I'm still helping the company to move towards an IPO that Emil, uh, the CEO, has uh, validated that it's going to happen uh, rather sooner than later. Um, I've spent time with three different startups, uh, Neo4j, Pentaho, and Sugar CRM. And then my first company after graduation was uh, Cambridge Technology Partners. Pure luck that I picked a company with 300 employees that later ramped to 7,000 within a very short time frame. Um, I, I think I've been quite lucky to get to interesting exits with, uh, with three of these four, and then with Neo4j now having a promising outlook with an IPO here coming up, hopefully this year or next. Uh, it's quite exciting. Uh, academics put a lot of time into, into school, uh, and um, nowadays, if I'm not speaking at a webinar with uh, with uh, Sami, I'm spending some time with with another uh, VC, Creandum, uh, and uh, ending up spending a lot of time on the ski slope. And that's probably the best way to get hold on me. So let's get into it. Scaling sales, what does that mean? So first of all, it's, it's all about getting the ARR to ramp at the reasonable rate. And uh, you can grow a company at various rates, but if you want to attract money, capital from a VC or a private equity company, you need to grow at a certain rate, very likely. And uh, usually below 10 million in ARR, you need to double as a minimum on an annual basis. And then post 10 million, you need to grow at least at the 50% rate to attract typical VCs. There are exceptions to this, but usually VCs like Vendip Capital and others would expect you to double, if not triple, the first couple of years and then double uh, going forward. Then eventually, as you hit 40, 50, 60 million, then the pressure on that growth is a little bit less, but still 50% is, is a typical target as a minimum. You need to be able to predict the growth. You can't represent the roller coaster. Very few investors will accept that. Sales leaders, others will be replaced when that happens pretty quickly. When you commit to an operations plan, you usually do that in November prior to your next calendar year. And that means that you need to start to look into the next coming four quarters. When you start with the operations plan, probably in August or September, you're looking five quarters out and you need to be able to predict that at a decent rate. Both operating expenditures and ARR need to be within that plus minus 20% or it will cause stress. Obviously you can have a higher growth, you can have a lower OPEX, but usually it is the other way around. In terms of the sales organization to be able to scale, you need to get salespeople to a certain productivity fairly quickly. Within the first year, you wanna get reps to about three times what you pay them. So if on target earning for an enterprise rep is 250K euro, then in their fourth quarter, they should produce an annualized number equal to 3x that. And then in their second full year, 4x their compensation would be typical. If you're not hitting those numbers, then you should challenge yourself if it is time to expand with more salespeople. And I refer to here, typically you may have four or five salespeople, then before you expand with more than five salespeople, you, you need to hit these, these multiples or have a good reason for, for the expansion. And then obviously the most important thing, your GTM, your go-to-market strategy needs to be aligned with the overall company strategy. Is there a product market fit? Do you have the right distribution model? 
Do you have a cash burn strategy aligned with the board? If you go with some Silicon Valley investors, they may look less at ARR in the early days, as long as your formula for success is correct. Some European investors would pay a lot more attention to perhaps becoming cash flow neutral earlier. So depending on, on, your, on your investors, you, 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 need, you need to take the cash burn strategy into consideration. So that, that's scaling sales in my book. So then how do you do this? <clears throat> sales leadership, it starts with the leadership. Uh, and when I refer to sales leadership in the early day, that's not that super senior individual that is hands off. It is an individual with a strategic mindset, but with hands-on abilities. They need to be able to come in and close deals. They need to be able to hire, attract really good salespeople and other uh, individuals. They need to understand the overall company strategy. So it is a challenging uh, role in the beginning. The sales leadership team needs to be hands-on at the same time as they need to have uh, a good sense of, of the strategic direction of the company. Usually, I would recommend that you have two sales leadership offsites per year. Two to three days, twice per year uh, is the typical that I have uh, managed. When I have a sales leadership offsite or even a company offsite, I would usually promote uh, good discussions, exercise, good breaks for uh, dialogues, building friendship. And I would limit the alcohol, the distractions that's making you likely not to perform the next day. I would welcome a party over a weekend where the company would chip in if that's necessary. But when we have a leadership offsite, I want people to perform at their best. I usually would run an exercise in the morning at 6.45 every morning. That means that people are not out drinking at 2 a.m. for some reason. And the harder they have been out, the harder the exercise is. And usually my motto is that when you return from the offsite, you are in better shape than when you arrived. And many offsites, you are a wreck when you return. And the offsite has not been very productive. Playbook. Playbook is an instrument, a tool that is helping the organization to execute. Sales leaders should own the sales playbook. The best sales leader should be the orchestrator, not some hands-off individual that has not been closing deals. It needs to be someone that is in it. Very important. Then in terms of building a startup, it's a chaotic environment. You have issues on a daily basis. Your job is not to remove all those issues. You get no credit for removing an issue or a bottleneck. It's all about addressing the bottlenecks that are blocking you from hitting your ARR numbers this year and next year. That's it. There are exceptions to this, but often at an offsite, you dream up all the issues in the company and it's going to take you full time to fix all those issues. That's not the job. Let's focus on the bottlenecks that's blocking us from hitting the number this, this year, period. Communication. Weekly pipeline call is what I usually do. One hour where I invite all the commercial people, salespeople, sales engineers, marketing, professional services. It's only mandatory to the salespeople, but usually 95% of the commercial organization would join the call. 20 minutes would be general update. 40 minutes would be account specific. This is confidential information discussed. It cannot leak. If it leaks, that person is removed from the organization. No exception. But that also gives us the opportunity to be very transparent. It gives us the opportunity to share a lot of exciting information to everyone. But confidentiality will be reminded to everyone frequently. A weekly leadership call, very important to have that sales leadership meet to discuss issues, to discuss how to hit the number, the current quarter, and the next quarter, and so on. 
And then last but not least, a weekly forecast submitted by the salespeople and the sales leaders and a weekly status update by everyone. And it doesn't need to be a formal, good looking update, but it is at least a brief update on what is taking place in the organization. Customer strategy. After all, the most important thing is to get customers to purchase the product or the service and then to consume it with a decent satisfaction level. You have to pay attention to the customer as a founder, as a sales leader, anyone in the organization should pay attention to the customer install base. The product market fit is super important. Great salespeople can sell anything, but you wanna make sure that the early product is becoming a good fit with the market. If not, you may need, you may need to pivot your, your company direction and the product strategy. You need to make sure that you get enough of uh, customers uh, to use the product to understand what use cases will become your sweet spot areas. If you focus on few large accounts, then they will drive you perhaps in the wrong direction. And it may depend on how the sales individual is closing a deal. And that should not be the case. Make sure you have a focus on smaller deals. A smaller deal would be 30K up to 100K in ARR. And then, of course, as the company is growing, you will start to expand. But don't have deals that will skew the company direction. Limit professional services to ensure that the product can actually meet customer expectations without a lot of customization. If not, you need to spend more time on engineering to find that product market fit, right? Otherwise, you start to expand with sales, marketing, and other functions that are very costly, but the product is not ready. Track your top 20 customers. Initially, of course, you have less than 20 customers, but over time, you're going to pay a lot more attention to your top 20 accounts. However, remember what I said earlier, do not close monster deals that will skew the company direction. Over time, your top 20 representation of total ARR should decline every quarter. So every quarter you would wanna see 38%, next quarter, 37% and so on. And it means that you're building a good, healthy install base of a number of accounts rather than staying focused on just few very large accounts. Not saying that's wrong, but that's a different model that I would recommend that you stay away from since it's a lot more risky. Over time, as you grow, you hit 10 million, start to pay more attention to your existing accounts. Start to roll out a named account strategy where your existing most promising accounts are getting a lot more attention. At Neo4j, we had a 50-50 ratio between new business versus expansion throughout my entire 12-year journey. And once in a while, we had to pay more attention to new business. And that meant that in compensation plans, we had to provide more SPIFs to drive that attention to new business. Once in a while, we had to put more attention to our named account strategy, meaning that many of those were existing accounts that resulted in expansion sell. But you don't want to focus only on existing accounts when you only have 50 accounts. And you don't want to pay attention only to new business and, and, and uh, lose attention from your existing install base. So to me, 50-50 distribution has been very healthy. And then last but not least, when you work with customers, allow the deal structure to grow annually. You want upsell from your existing opportunity every year. And uh, even, even better would be every quarter. Don't exhaust an opportunity up front where you provide an all-you-can-eat deal. And then when it comes up for renewal, there is nothing more to sell since the customer has got a sweet deal where there is no revenue upside. You may want to do that for one year or for two years in the beginning to make it very compelling. 
for the customer. But make sure that there is upsell over time since you need to make sure that the revenue that you bring in today is easier to bring in tomorrow. Otherwise, you need to hunt for new business all the time, and that's not scalable. It's not going to help you to scale fast enough. All right, let's see here if we can move to the next slide. The sales culture. So this one is important. At Neo4j, we spend a lot of time on the culture. I included Emil, uh, the co-founder and CEO in many of the sales offsites and in many of the weekly meetings in the beginning to set the culture. Super important. You don't want salespeople to become too aggressive to hit numbers. You don't want them to be too lame either. You need to meet customer expectations. You need to exceed customer expectations in a loyal and legal way. No exceptions to that. But the culture is set by the leaders in the beginning. ARR, board commits, are very important to me to be achieved. No excuses. If you start to allow excuses in the beginning, then I guarantee you that you will continue to miss numbers all the time. To hit a quarterly number, it is usually extremely challenging. But if you put all the efforts into it, you will likely hit that number if you have done a good job in the beginning to build a reasonable operations plan. But as soon as that ops plan has been committed to, your sales leadership team and your uh, salespeople, they need to be committed. They need to be rewarded highly to hit numbers, but excuses are not tolerated at that point. At NEO, throughout 48 quarters, we were hitting 44 quarters out of 48. We missed four quarters, but it was not an easy journey, but it required a lot of planning and a lot of hard work. And also, of course, a great amount of luck. Uh, but take those board commits very serious. In terms of uh, low performing assets, uh, employees that are struggling, you need to replace those people quickly. And it's not that you are trying to be unfair to those people. It could be that you did not do a good job in the hiring process. It could be that the company is not right for them. It can be many reasons why a person is not a good fit at this moment for this company. And you need to replace them quickly or it's going to drag down performance of your company. Then having that said, it's very easy to point at an individual and convince yourself that that's the reason for us not hitting the number. If you make those mistakes, you're in trouble. If you start to let go of very strong performers because you don't understand where they struggle and why they struggle, then you have a bigger problem. So do not let go of strong performers because it could be that their learning curve is just longer. They need one and a half year to learn. But at that point, they're kicking butt. It could be politics among the employees. It could be a temporary a personal distraction for that individual that may fly by quickly. And if you give them the time, they will be the most committed employee in the company. So think through this, but if you clearly know that you have a low performing asset, get rid of them quickly. Do not tolerate the culture where you have underperforming assets, especially not in the beginning. To continue on that uh, note, uh, sales culture and sales organization, kind of the same. Focus on typical type A go-getters in the beginning. They need to have a dynamic mindset. And I refer here mostly to the sales rep organization, the account executive. What I mean with a dynamic mindset 
is someone that is challenged by this opportunity where selling is very hard in the beginning. No one has done it with success. We're the first people in the company to try to push this over the finish line. It is hard. Every quarter is brutally hard. But these people needs to build up this fighting spirit where they love it. Some people complain, come up with reasons why we cannot succeed and so on. Those are not the right people in the beginning. In the beginning, you need all around people with a mindset where they can do everything. One day they build a pipeline. The next day they write a white paper. The third day they run a webinar. The fourth day they talk to a developer. The fifth day they speak to an executive at the customer organization. They need to be in this multitask uh, setting and everyone can't do that. Over time, you're going to attract what I call coin operated reps. When you give them a territory, you give them a comp plan, they have a product to sell, they have a comp plan that is attractive to them, they're going to kick butt. But if you don't give them a sales engineer, if you don't give them the white paper, if you don't give them the pipeline, they will likely not perform. Those are not necessarily the people you want in the beginning, since in the beginning you have nothing, right? So it's a transition from the Renaissance oriented rep all the way up to five, six, seven people. And then you start to attract coin operated reps with great experience of just hitting numbers. Never be in a situation where a top rep resigns because you have not been proactive enough. The top reps, they make big money. They are often high maintenance to you as a leader, but they also make a huge difference and help you to hit the number. So make sure you pay them well, you be fair to them, and you're proactive. If you get a notice from them that they are resigning, it's probably too late to rescue them. And the cost to replace a top rep is incredible high. It takes you six months to attract a new person. It takes a year to ramp that person. And 50% of the people you hire may not perform very well. So never, ever lose a top rep. Pay attention to them. Another point is when you are pressured to hire people, you have committed to a headcount with the board. Do not fill up a headcount with unacceptable candidates. It's better to reset expectations with the board that you're running behind on hiring. Do not allow the wrong people to join your firm. It will be a disaster. It's going to be very hard over time since those people would then start to attract their friends. And then you have an even bigger problem. So delay hiring if you don't find good enough candidates. And I repeat item number six here, replace low performing assets quickly. You sense in your third month that this is not a good fit, then work it out. Don't treat a low performing asset as a criminal. Treat them with respect. Work out an exit path that's good for both parties. Usually someone that's not a good fit would know it themselves. Give them some time to find another job that's a better fit for them. It may not be something wrong with the individual themselves. Could be wrong with the company that makes it uh, a poor fit right now. But address it quickly. All right. Uh, compensation plans. So I speak to founders quite frequently and advise them on comp plans. And for many technical founders, a comp plan is something weird. Why would you need a comp plan to motivate someone to work hard for my company and my product? But great salespeople are making a lot of money since they're very close to a customer and they make a lot big difference. And you need to play that game to attract very good salespeople. There are exceptions to this where you can run a company without the comp plan. I buy into that but it's hard to make that scale fast since then you need to convince every single salesperson that is in your hiring process that you have a different model. In the beginning, often the product is very hard to sell. 
and the pipeline is weak, then you need to provide a compelling compensation plan that is driving them to work hard. You want them to be consistent with their performance. You do not want an annual quota where they tell you in the second quarter that they're in good shape, but they don't have anything until the last quarter. You want them to perform every quarter since likely you have committed numbers to the board on a quarterly basis and you need your salespeople to be aligned with those commitments. So try to come up with a consistency bonus that creates incentives for the salespeople to hit numbers quarterly. Make them reasonable, but make it hard for them to go on too long of a vacation in the third quarter if they have hit Q1 and Q2. Since your best salespeople are the ones that can rescue you in a challenging quarter. Then of course, everyone needs to take time off to so plan it well, but create incentives for you to hit your quarterly numbers. In the beginning, limit multi-year deal structures. If you lock in a three-year deal early, I bet you that that salesperson is not going to spend much time with that customer. And there's very limited upsell if they have already paid upfront. And your pricing model is not optimized likely, so you may leave a lot of money on the table. Obviously, over time, you want the customer to commit. But in the beginning, if you don't have a good product market fit, then let them churn. You need to figure out what the fit is going to be to let you scale fast. And if you only lock in three-year customers early, you will need to wait three years to know if that churn is going to hit you or not. That's not good. The comp plan itself should be, in my book, a one-year plan. If you have hidden clauses that would give the company the right to change the comp plan for any reason, salespeople will figure that out and they will create a behavior that's not likely aligned with the company interest. So be honest, be transparent, and provide a fair plan to the salesperson. That likely means that they will work very, very hard and stay very loyal to the company. Last but not least, in the beginning, you may face a big commit to the board, and then you start to distribute the quotas to your sales organization, and you start to realize that it's going to be very hard to add on a contingency to the rep quotas since that means that the rep is not going to be committed. The number is too high. Then it may mean that you as a sales leader needs to accept a quota to the board that is not lower than the total rep quota. And that can be scary. One argument is that the sales rep hitting quota is not working as soon as they hit quota. My experience is the opposite. As soon as they get close to be able to hit the number, they're working harder since they make a lot more money after they hit the quota. And if you make that quota reasonable, you're going to get an organization that's going to work very hard to overperform. All right. Let's get into geographies and territories. Start with one continent. You cannot be distracted with multiple continent in the beginning. It is very hard for you as a leader to travel from one continent to another to please customers, salespeople, and others in various uh, parts of the world. Start with one. Uh, if you start with EMEA, start with three to five countries that can provide you scale. You may want to pick one small country like Luxembourg to experiment. But then make sure you hit the big countries where you can actually find repeatable sales opportunities and then force your organization to crack issues in those larger markets early. If you are focused on Germany and it's hard to close deals in Germany, well, let's crack that issue before you let people close deals in Poland and Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, since those parts of the world will not give you enough ARR over time. Hit the large markets and crack those issues early. 
territory splits. So when you provide a territory to a sales rep in the beginning, they will every year experience a decline in territory size. Initially, a rep would own half of the world probably. But over time, as you have 10 reps, provide them all a target core market that they will own for the longer run. Then their current territory might be bigger, but they should know the core that they may be able to keep for three years. And then they would have an extended territory where they may get an opportunity to keep accounts long-term if they build great success. Be very careful to delegate the larger territory to a rep and then change the ownership every year after they have put a lot of time into it. And don't remove promising accounts if they have put a year into it. So it forces you to stay ahead of the game to figure out what accounts should be assigned, what territories should be assigned to what rep. But don't surprise reps since they get pissed off very quickly and that is going to impact their productivity. I'm going to skip a few items here. I can easily spend two days on, on this material and happy to get back to some of this material at a different session. Let's get into the pipeline. The pipeline is also a critical component. Hire a demand gen team early. Someone that is hands-on, understand the challenges of building the pipeline, can work with their sales organization to actually make it work. Try to figure out the outbound function early. The outbound function is very hard, but you need to figure this out sooner or later. With open source companies, you may get a lot of inbound traffic, but over time you must crack this one. And it's, the larger you get, the harder it is. So build a demand gen team early, find a top gun to run the team and figure out the outbound function very early. Last but not least on this topic, when you have an SEO and a well-defined description of that SEO, do not change that metric. Do not change that definition. You can introduce other metrics related to the SEO, but the core metric, do not change it. I experienced that many people wanted to change the SEO definition since then they can't be held accountable to how we performed yesterday. As soon as you change the metric, you can't compare it to the history. And then you can come up with arguments why your quotas going forward will be different. So try to come up with definitions that you can stick to long-term. Sales operations and analytics to keep track on the sales organization you need sales operations and analytics that will help sales to stay productive and efficient short-term, long-term. This is a team that you need to build up as you start to hit 5 million in ARR. And as you get to 10 million, you must have a sales ops team in place. Make sure you get someone that gets it. You should not have an individual that's rolling out too many processes and policies too early that's going to limit the, the efficiency. Even though you become a structured organization, you may not scale, you may not ramp fast enough. So advanced policies over time. If you hire a new sales leader that comes in from a large organization, they're likely used to have a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of processes, a lot of policies in place. Those may not fit your company at this stage. So. Be smart about what policies and processes that you roll out on an annual basis to make them acceptable. And key here is that these processes and policies are ruled out to help the salespeople to hit their numbers, right? So you shouldn't roll them out to police the salespeople, but you should roll them out to structure the organization in a more efficient manner. And if you go overboard here, it's going to hit your growth very quickly.
Sales learning curve. This is a super important metric when you expand your sales organization. It takes time for a rep to become productive. It usually looks like an S curve. And it usually takes up to 12 months to get productive when it comes to enterprise sales. With inside sales or B2C, it goes faster. I recommend that you track every single salesperson that you hire from month one when they are hired, and then every month you plot their ARR. And they all start uh, in the same position to the left. Then you start to get an S curve of the average. And if new hires fall below the S curve after the fourth or the fifth month, that's a warning signal. And over time, you will start to pay attention to those reps that are underperforming. Do they come back? What do you need to do to get them to perform better? And how do you avoid this going forward? But it's a very useful tool to track uh, rep performance. And it's a very good tool to tell an underperformer that they're way behind. And it's also a very good tool to create training material to actually get reps to perform better over time. Legal, this can become a big bottleneck if you don't pay attention to it. The legal person is, in the, is included in every single deal, especially when it comes to enterprise sales. A large portion of the sales cycle is legal. You need to have a legal individual that has low ego and common sense. You do not want to fight with a customer lawyer. You want to be aligned with their interest. Of course, you got to push for the stuff that's most important to you. And usually my mindset when I speak to lawyers is that if the clause can impact a future fundraising event or an acquisition, then we need to push back. If not, let's really challenge the legal term. Does it really matter? I have not experienced issues with a customer a single time when it comes to legal uh, issues that becomes an extreme dialogue with fights. Never. But I've spent so many hours with lawyers to reach agreements on, on customer contracts. So, so apply common sense here. Get a lawyer that can support you short-term, long-term with common sense. That brings us to the end. Tips and tricks. I'm not going to go through all these but I recommend you to, to walk through this with the material that we're going to share after the webinar. I think the most important one here for sales leaders or for uh, CEOs is to stay 45 to 60 days ahead of your committed schedule. What do I mean with this? Well, we started this dialogue with, with the operations plan committed to the board in November timeframe. If you can just make sure that you stay two months ahead of your committed schedule, everything is easy. Since if you're going to grow 100% year over year and you can stay a little bit ahead of the committed game, then guess what? Your numbers will be far ahead of, of uh, what you have committed to. Easier said than done, right? Since as soon as you have performed, overperformed, the board would ask you to commit to higher numbers. So this is, uh, this is a game you need to orchestrate with yourself, but try to stick 60 days ahead of the committed schedule and you'll be fine. There are many other things to pay attention to here. Happy to go through those throughout the Q&A or at the later date. Last but not least, when you work at a startup, a fast ramping organization, whether or not you're zero at ARR or 100 million in ARR, it is a crazy environment where most days in the week, you ask yourself if this is ever going to work. At Neo4j, every quarter, we were struggling to hit numbers. Every quarter, we were convinced that this is never going to work. But then eventually, you get some tailwind. Pay attention to your own improvement opportunity. If you can do things on a daily basis that matters, if that is hitting the gym or sleeping another hour, whatever it is that is getting you to improve, 
a little bit on a daily basis is going to make a huge difference. If you start to apply bad habits from the beginning, your startup will fail big time. Since it's not a one-year journey. At Neo4j, for me, it was a 12-year journey and Emil is still there kicking butt to move it to the next level. It's a long journey and you have to pay attention to your daily habits to take care of yourself. With that said, that brings us to a Q&A. And I'm going to hand it over Very to good. Tommy here that will orchestrate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, super, super great content, super great advice. Uh, let's let's dive into the questions. So uh, so there's a, there's a question online about, uh, you know, removing account too early from a rep. <clears throat> so can you comment on uh, what is the kind of the role of customer success account management versus the sales rep? Uh, and, and, you know, any, any tips and tricks around that? Uh, sure. So you need to analyze a territory to be able to split it. And when you analyze your territory or your continent, you look at the number of available enterprise organizations, the number of available SMBs. You look perhaps at your pipeline and current traction with current customers to understand where are your sweet spots. Maybe you're very strong within the financial services vertical and you have 10 customer references in this area. So obviously that function, that area is more promising than perhaps retail. But as you have figured out a fairly uh, good distributed uh, a geo, then if a rep is putting a lot of time into an account and they have worked out for six quarters and they start to build ARR, it's very hard for that rep to see that account be taken away. Then of course, you can argue that, well, if they have 20 accounts, uh, they can't keep them all. Well, that would be very rare. If you have certain criteria for success, like active ARR, uh, documented meetings, and so on, then you start to get into three, four, five accounts. Other accounts, you lack active opportunities. There is no documentation in the CRM system and so on. And my ground rule is that if there is very limited documentation in the CRM system about an account, then that account is not active. It can get reassigned at any time. Yeah, so going account by account as well. How yeah. about then, so, so I know many organizations kind of have the pipeline model where, you know, sales exec signs a deal, gets a commission, hands it over to account management or customer success was is his hands and he's off to hunting the next deal. How do you see that? Like, how about the upsell then? You know, is is it is is because I know I know the you know the for J model. So kind of, what's your opinion on that? Like, how should that upsell? You know, right. I close I close the deal now, but there's an upsell for next year. Who really yeah. owns it, right? So there are many ways to execute, and leaders have different preferences. Uh, I'm not saying one is right, one is wrong. It depends on what you want to do. My preference is to give the account executive that owns the territory and has closed the initial deal. That person is also the owner of any upsell or cross-sell, right? Since when you, especially with enterprise sales, uh, build a relationship with a customer, it's going to take you a year, maybe two years to close that deal. They have become a friend with that organization. Then to hand it over to someone else, that's very hard. For inside sales, for B2C, different story, right? If it's a transactional sell, you can hand it over at any time. But for enterprise sale, uh, understand and respect that investment and you can't just take that away. Having that said, you need a renewal team, you need a customer success team with different purposes. To me, a customer success team is focused on getting the customer into production. That person, that organization is very good to help with upsell and cross-sell, and you may compensate them or incentivize them as well, but the owner of ARR is the account executive, the rep. For the renewal team, they should be measured on that gross retention but also on the net retention, that upsell, cross-sell. 
So you have multiple people paid on an account and finance may argue that this is double comp. Sure, but you need to figure out the formula. How much can you pay the different people? But the account rep yeah. takes the uh, major accountability for the account. Since if they miss a couple of quarters, they are replaced. Other people like customer success is not under the same pressure and they're not asking for the same checks. That's my opinion, but there are other ways to do it. But I think yeah. to me, the rep is the CEO of the territory and they're accountable for those accounts. And if you want to replace an account, then have a transition and double comp two reps, maybe throughout a one year period. Uh, and then it goes away. Very good. Uh, plenty of questions here. Let's. Uh, let's pick one here. So with a with a with a complex product that requires a change from the customer side, right? Um, to to be successful, right? Um, what's your experience on on teaching the customers those positive habits around the, around the product? You know that will really then drive the product of the adoption of the customer. So, so sometimes you know you get the initial sale, but then there's no activation within the account, right? Right. So any any anything any any help around that? You, you mean in terms of the product fit, and you struggle to to make them successful? Yeah, or or you basically let's say you sell an enterprise product that could be used by everybody in the company, right? But it's a complex, it's still a complex product, but involves larger group of people from the customer. So yeah, is there ways how account management customer success can really kind of ensure the uptake of the product, right? So it's not the sale and a turn because nobody really, really actually started using it, right? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, at, at Neo, but also with other companies, we, we I mean, you, you see deals coming through and then you start to wonder if, if the customer is using it in the right way. Uh, some customers love the product and they get very creative they start to create use cases that are not a good fit uh, at all, but they still push for it. And then the problem is that you then start to see a disaster since the product is not used for that use case and you cannot help them over time. So that's one issue. Uh, I think customer success purpose is to keep them in the right direction. You may wanna expand with professional services uh, directly or throughout uh, a partner as well. But finding those repeatable use cases that become your sweet spot, I think is critical. Since if you have too many use cases and you have salespeople getting too creative, closing deals, they may hit initial ARR numbers, but those customers will not renew and they will become a pain before they sign off. And, and this is also the reason why I advised the audience to not close too large deals in the beginning. There are exceptions to this, but try to get a volume of accounts where you can exceed expectations with those customers. Then start to charge more, apply price increases. Uh, if you apply a, a consumption model to the pricing, then they will start to consume more. But don't oversell in the beginning since then you meet, don't meet expectations and you start to see downsell or worse, a churn. And when you have bad board meetings, that's when you have a large account that has churned. And a large account would be 200K in the beginning. If you have a 200 churn, it doesn't matter how you have performed. You will be in the doghouse for weeks. And if you know that a deal that you close will churn the next year, don't do it. Take the hit up front. That's a, that's so hard to do though. It's 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 a little bit counterintuitive and it's so hard to say that I'm, you know, Mr. Customer, I don't want your half a million, although yeah. it, it would buy me, it would buy me six more months of runway. Uh, yeah. let's let's uh, let's let's start with 50k and see how you how you guys really like it. So Little, little bit of counterintuitive and, and super hard to to truly kind of downsell before even the sale happens, right? Yeah. But makes makes sense but, over longer term. Yeah. yeah. And this is also the orchestration with other leaders. Uh, if you come up with customer case studies representing a strong use case, then promote the heck out of that. Since then, the demand gen organization 
will start to drive a pipeline related to that case study. That's just the way it works. And then you start to build white papers related to that use case. And then suddenly salespeople start to work only pipeline opportunities related to that success. But if you don't promote repeatable success early, then sales will get creative. They will close whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go for large single deals yeah. that, that they, they know will not work for longer term. Uh, let's, uh, so, so you, you kind of, I think you ch touched the partner model just, just a little bit. So in which point you see kind of starting to deploy partnerships, really channel model. Uh, of course it depends a little bit on what you're selling yeah. and who you're selling to, but like any, any thoughts around that? Like when, when do, when do the chart, you know, partners really come to play? Yeah. So, so with a webinar theme scaling, um, uh, uh, sales, uh, I think you need a partner organization. You need that ecosystem to support you. Maybe not initially, but over time, you need partners since you get many more uh, feet on the street that can represent you. Uh, are there large uh, global SIs or smaller regional ones? Are there OEMs or resellers? That's up to, to your company to figure out. But usually, I would argue that Putting a lot of time into alliances without having a customer involved is not worth the time. But if you have a sales opportunity, a customer that is using a large uh, consulting firm, then start to work with them on that opportunity and then find the next one. Work with that partner at that GSI, since they usually have would have a portfolio of customers. Or work with that practice leader, but stay very customer oriented. Stay away from the alliances people that may get paid for stuff that doesn't help you with ARR. But in general, partner up uh, marketplaces with the big cloud providers could be of significant support if you figure that out. But it can also be a large cost and distraction if you do it too early. But I think the, the short answer is yeah. the partner ecosystem is critical, but the right answer is perhaps not to hire a vice president of business development in the beginning. Why? Well, because you're going to hire a top gun that will create partnerships, but those partnerships will then require product integrations. And that requires engineering now to start to work on those when they don't have bandwidth to hit the product roadmap. So you got to figure out what partners to make a top priority and when to build those plugins. Since even though you get people from the partner organization, you need to take time from your own engineering team. And you may not want to do that too early. Right. And I think that this is this is something where, where sometimes startups get fooled a little bit by, you know, they're signing a lot of channel partners and expecting that magic just happens and the partner starts to sell. But if there's no pool in the market, uh, very, very, very few partners are willing to put themselves in line. Yeah. in order to sell your product when the customer doesn't come to them asking for it. So, yeah. My, my experience is that smaller regional consulting firms are super valuable, but then pay attention to the leader of that company. Is that leader a person that you would hire? And can you contribute to enough revenue to that leader mm -hmm. in their organization to, to make you important enough? So let's say that they have... 5 million in consulting services annually. Can you help them to drive another 2 million? That's a big chunk. And that's going to make you very important to them. And they will start to do things for you like an employee. That is a good criteria for me. Would I hire you? Then I would want to partner up with you. And if I can right. find 10 of those partners, one by country that are super loyal to me, they're betting their company on my product. Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, it's top of the hour, but Lars, if you have a couple more minutes, uh, there's tons of questions, so we could go uh, go over a couple more. Uh, so, so expanding expanding the territory. Uh, is there any type of a golden rule, like when when should I go for the next country? I mean, I know Neo started kind of from Europe, but then. Uh, especially you joining from the Valley, it very much, very quickly became very kind of a US-centric uh, go-to-market model. But 
when did yeah. you guys actually start the mic trading to outside of the US, outside of the core Europe area? Yeah, so we, we are probably an exception since we had uh, the engineering organization based in Malmö and London. Very few individuals, but we kept the engineering organization in Europe. And then I was based in Silicon Valley. Emil, as co-founder CEO, relocated over for a five-year period. And then we started to build out the commercial organization in the US, but we also allowed expansion in Europe since we had engineering over there. So we did two, something I don't recommend since it becomes a big distraction unless you truly know what you're doing. A direct advantage to it over time as you start to get to a return of your investment, but it's also scary in the beginning. So if you're a European organization, start with Europe, start with three countries. And it could be that, let's say that you're based in Finland and Finland must be a market that you succeed in. That's your home market. And then pick two large markets, UK and Dach. I call Dach a country, but you get my point. So if you go overboard with Spain, Portugal, Italy, Eastern Europe, then you're gonna get transactions everywhere, but those are transactions. They will not become repeatable opportunities, but you have to go to all those locations to close deals. Crack the issues in Germany and the UK, and you will start to see repeatable sales opportunities. My experience is that salespeople early scatter the market and they find opportunities everywhere. And they wanna to go to all those locations to close deals. But you need to crack the issues in the core markets to scale. If you don't figure that out, you will start to plateau over time. But since there are always early adopters in every country, as soon as those are gone, then you need to get into the core market and close deals at BMW, at Siemens. And that's brutally tough. But an early adopter excited in a new technology, you're not selling to them. They're picking you and they're buying from you. You think that you have sold to them and you have done a great job. That's not the way it works. They have already picked your technology and they want to buy. But then over time, you need to move into a larger organization and sell. And that's much harder. Yeah. No. So stay stay um, focused. And then don't underestimate the US market. The US market, it is much easier to sell software in the US. US buyers are more aggressive. They go with bigger numbers. They're bolder. It's less consensus and, and more an individual decision for an IT leader to pick a supplier. It's much easier in the US market to become successful. But it's hard in the beginning for a European company. So make sure you have success on your home turf before you go there. But you cannot be without the US market. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's the most important market in, in very many segments. Uh, so uh, then question around kind of onboarding a customer success. Um, so when, you, when you're really ramping up things, you're getting to maybe a little bit higher ARR levels. Uh, how did you cage how much kind of customer support, customer success, uh, you know, is, is, is okay to be deployed? Uh, how do you measure that? And, and, and uh, you know, if, if you start seeing churn, should you deploy more or, you know, how do you kind of navigate that? Right. Um, to me, Customer success is costly. Customer success is usually professional services individuals helping out for free. doesn't have to be that way, but often yeah. customer success is included in the subscription price. So you need to think through your formula so you don't get into a situation where you provide free customer success services. And then you start to compete with professional services that may ask for, for the same work, but they are going to charge for it. So to me, CS, customer success, is focused on getting the customer into production. And they're going to stick to a playbook that's very consistent by account. If the customer would want to customize their journey and they need help, that's professional services. Then obviously, if you have a use case or you have product stickiness that's not really there. We talked about this earlier. 
if it's not a good fit and you have forced a cell to happen, then you have problems all day long. So in the beginning, this is the reason why I recommend that you stay focused on a volume of accounts. You want dozens of accounts to tell you if this product is a good fit. If you only have a handful of accounts and you have professional services and you see big ARR numbers, then you probably have a very, very good salesperson that have closed deals that are not repeatable. And then the next customer will ask for golden services as well. And you want customers to consume your product by themselves. In an extreme way, without support, without customer success, you want to throw the product over the fence and make the customer successful without your involvement, right? Even better would be if you can close a deal without salespeople, right? But focus on a volume of accounts initially, find your sweet spot use cases and make them repeatable. And then over time you will optimize and therefore the CS process will be uh, of less involvement. And then of course, if you get into bigger accounts with, with 500K a million in ARR, then my recommendation is that you have professional services on those accounts. You want people in those accounts to make the customer successful. And those people will become good friends with the customer and find new opportunities. Yeah, and expansion. So, so kind of related, uh, how, how, do you, how do you manage churn? What gets you worried in, in churn? Is there a certain level... Of course, you're following a trend line somehow, like is it is up or down and so forth. But like, are there some triggers and, and any any kind of post-mortems that, that kind of, what are your tips and tricks there? Yeah, many. Um, so churn is cancer, right? You need to focus on this early uh, since it gets scary. It becomes big headache in the company if you don't uh, control it. Um, so churn... Some churn is good. You may close deals early and you do not want that to renew. It's just too much maintenance. And that's okay. Since in the beginning, you close whatever deal <laughs> to just get going. But over time, maybe that deal is not the deal you want to keep. Then work with the customer, work them out from, from that commitment. But in general, the trigger for success is that the customer gets into production ASAP. Right. If the customer do not get their implementation into production, and often we struggle, sales do not know if they are into production. The definition of production varies. And you think that they are in production and then they churn and you learn that they're not in production. So the number one advice would be do not accept what the customer is telling you. Understand and analyze actually what they're doing. Those are two different things. What they're doing and what they're telling you are two different things. And if you listen to them, it's not that they are misrepresenting the truth, but everyone are not plugged in. So if you have a CS person or a professional service person involved, have them understand what you're actually doing. And are they dependent on the product? And if not, they will probably not renew. And in an up market, it usually renews as soon as the market turns around quickly, those projects will churn. So get customers into production ASAP. That's number one. And then watch other activities going on. If they don't log any uh, product support cases and the product is not perfect, then something is wrong. No. If they don't buy training, if they don't discuss upsell, something is wrong. You want to be able to get a transaction every month. It can be a very small one. But if they put the person into training, 500 bucks, well, that's a good indicator. You want the company to have a dialogue with you over time. And the salesperson closing the deal is often on to the next opportunity. So then who in your organization will take care of this account and understand what's actually taking place? Very important. And we had... At a stage, I think we were around 10 million when we rolled out our renewals team. And we started to experience that salespeople did not pay attention to the renewal. They assumed that the account was yeah. going to renew. And then suddenly we started to realize that we had to churn everywhere. And even worse, when you had a three-year deal, 
they had churned after six months. It's just that the contract nobody knew two yeah. years. So we didn't know. Exactly. So yeah. have someone in your organization that over time will become your renewal team and customer success team to pay attention to those accounts. Since the salesperson is asked to hit ARR numbers, right? And if they can choose between working a deal that's going to help them to hit the number or work a deal they closed last quarter that's not giving them any ARR, what do you think is going to happen? Very simple. Yep. Yep. Very good. So let's 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 close uh, with maybe maybe a little bit simpler final question. Uh, should sales team uh, different different uh, roles in the sales team get options be part of the ownership program in the company? Uh, say again. Should should salespeople have options in the company? Options. Yes. Um, well, you ask uh, a person that spent twenty years in the U.S. and in Silicon Valley, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, for, for people in the Valley, you do not work for a startup without getting stock options in the company. Then various countries have different tax laws that makes it less incentive to, to, to get those. But in general, I think it's very important to get employees aligned with the company's strategy and feel that they are part of that financial success as well. Then as I always tell people I hire, do not expect a life-changing event with these options. It may not give you much money at all, but at least you feel that you're part of the journey with some financial ownership. Then, of course, if you're a founder or a leader, you have a bigger stake, but you also take a lot bigger risk, and, and it's a stressful environment on a daily basis for years. But in general, definitely stock option programs should be in place for a fast scaling organization. Since the work is for many people brutal on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, there is no uh, easy way to build a startup. Every single successful company you have seen out there, they struggle every day. And it's a brutal environment to get to that success, period. And therefore you need to incentivize people to be aligned with, with, with that path. Very good. I uh, work quarter. We're fifteen minutes over already. I, I see some people signing off. So I think uh, I think we're done for the day. Uh, and, and sorry that we couldn't answer every question. We we got plenty of questions online. Uh, any any final notes, Lars? Before we close. Um. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um. Uh, very honored to to speak at this webinar. Hopefully the audience enjoyed it. Uh, if you guys uh, want to get into a follow through session with Sami and myself, uh, contact Sami. Uh, we will get that orchestrated uh, and then enjoy your startup journey. Do not give up. Uh, most companies know that they will fail three, four days out of five every week until that IPO. That's just the way it works. Stay confident and enjoy the ride since as you step down or you transition out, no one is going to thank you after the fact. So make sure that you enjoy the ride throughout the entire journey. And if the ride is not the right one for you, get out, find another one. Very good. Lars, uh, huge thanks for for taking the time. Uh, very valuable, uh, very valuable, uh, you know, tips and tricks and uh, and uh, and advice for for the audience. Uh, huge thanks. Uh, that basically uh, concludes our spring twenty twenty four SaaS camps, and we're hoping to see you guys again next fall uh, when when the fall uh, series will will, will kick off. As mentioned in the beginning, uh, everybody will get a link to the recording and we will distribute the slides as well. And, and as Lars said, uh, be in touch uh, with any questions um, you, you may still have after, after the session. So very much uh, looking forward to, to talking to everybody later on. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ami.